filmed on one of our regular field trips, this is St Luke's Community History Group. This is no ordinary gathering. These folk belong to the last generation to call themselves Finsbury people. I'm Polly Mann and I've been leading the group for nearly 15 years. Most are now in their 80s and they've seen momentous changes during their lives. They get together to research their own stories and the stories of the area, but perhaps none are more dramatic than those of the present day. Few Londoners could tell you where Finsbury is today, but it was once a thriving London metropolitan borough with a unique character and identity all of its own. Where did it go and what made Finsbury so special? This film tells the Finsbury story and captures some remarkable testimonies before they disappear forever. Well, all work was manual. Yes. Yeah, well, somebody so had to build the country up after the war. And we were that basically the first generation, really. Yeah. The Garrett Street There's is Garrett where, where, where Whitbridge was. Whit Whitbridge used to keep all their horses down there, they're the stables. My gran, Granny Longer, brought us both into the world. John came, I've got a better memory than you, John came in February and I came along a couple of months after in March. There's two months between John and me. John don't remember all these little things, but women do. Remember all the family. There she is, look, that's, that's my old gran. Can we move that oh, over? I know your gran, I know her well. There's my dad. Here's my mum. Oh yes, I know your mum. I used to see it when I worked and in the Barbican. I'm right down on the left hand side. That's you, isn't it? Here's me, look. Is that you? That's me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, remember you. Got my best cap on. <laughs> yeah, you ain't changed a lot. You're right. Nicely dressed. In them dressed. days we were well, well, we were well right. dressed and well looked after. Absolutely. Yeah. Your dad and my dad were drinking partners. A lot of people don't even know. I mean, most people don't, couldn't, even when Finsbury was alive, didn't really recognise Finsbury was Finsbury. They thought it, it came down on one of the three main roads to get into, the, into London. I didn't realise between those uh, roads there were areas of living and little communities. Finsbury was considered the second most densely occupied borough in London. And then you're going back to Jack the Ripper times doing that. And the, the density was, was tremendous. You, you know, the sort of thing was round here, you had 12,000 people, and of those 12,000 people, only 200 had baths. And that was in the 1920s. Every floor, a family to every floor. More than a family to each floor. Because I think the railway money there, at that time, was about £2.10 a week. Mm. Well, the rent was two pound two and six, so we had to get the money from somewhere. <laughs> we was I was on the ground floor. Five children, mother and father. We were allowed to let rooms, so the oh. top floors and the first floors we were let to let to tenants. On the first floor, and they were clowns in the circus. On the top floor, we had all the all in wrestlers. And down in the basement, we had a little back room there. I'll never forget it, it's old Mr. Clements. He used to write all day. He was another lodger, but it was profitable. It's well, the wrestlers taught me how to wrestle. They to throw me across the room. <laughs> One of the first Asian mayors in Britain, Dr. Catiel, saw the effects of deprivation on the health of the people who came to his surgery. He was a friend of Gandhi. He'd taken Gandhi around London from 1931. I think it was a Commonwealth conference. And uh, he introduced Gandhi to Charlie Chaplin. Terribly important, terribly important in the um, social and health policy in London. Airbrushed out of history. Together with Finsbury Council leader, Alderman Riley, 
Dr Catiel set up a team to bring the borough's disparate health provisions together under one roof. This was just part of a revolutionary Finsbury master plan to improve the lives of its citizens that included social housing, new libraries, health centres and bathing facilities. Finsbury approached architect Berthold Lubetkin, a Russian émigré whose modernist architecture was considered radical, if not revolutionary. The resulting Finsbury Health Centre was hugely influential, both as a piece of architecture and as a model health service. It was a nice place to come actually because to what we, where we all lived in old houses with no bathrooms or anything, you walked in here and it was like, oh, <laughs> you know, it was like a palace really. And uh, we all sat around in a big circle in our knickers and our goggles and we had the sunray treatment. So that, so that it was about 1944 really because um, that's when we needed the extra sun which we didn't really get at that time. <laughs> It's and certainly inside because uh, my doctors uh, not, are yeah, here inside, and uh, it, inside when you go into yeah. the consulting rooms it's uh, really rather nice. Um, the Finsbury Health Centre is really special because it was the first ever purpose-built health centre in the country and uh, it was an inspiring piece of architecture because uh, the, the quality of what was put together uh, was just fantastic. The sense of light and air and spaciousness that was deliberately created. Um, the architect uh, Bertolt Lubetkin um, uh, had this fundamental philosophy about all his work which was that nothing was too good for ordinary people and he wanted to build a health palace for the people of Finsbury. I mean, when I go around there to have my feet done, I say to them, oh, that was there, the dentist was there. They had everything there. And then underneath was the fumigating centre because they used to, when they used to move, they, the old war cry went out, don't forget to take the bugs with you. The Finsbury Health Centre soon became a symbol of all that was good in modern Britain, as this wartime poster shows. But the fight with disease and neglect was being replaced by other conflicts. I, I mean, I was 11 when the war broke out, so um, because my dad was a fruit runner, yeah. <laughs> I knew all about fruit. So, but they gave him two. When, when he was conscripted, he was 34 when they called him up, wow. and they gave him two weeks wow. to get rid of his business, everything. Mm. And, it, it, I mean, he not only kept us, he kept his father as well, because it was my granddad's business, really. But he was mm. too old to take it on then. Yeah. And um, so my dad just got rid of everything. After the bombing, from the school, they, they, they started evacuating children and um, I went and I met some very nice people there, it was really nice but I was only there for 14 days, mum come down and she said well we might as well go together like you know so we come back home. Three weeks we was evacuated, I was four, my sister was two and my young sister, my baby sister was three weeks old. We went to Leicester, and uh, we wasn't far. It got bombed. Part of it got bombed, and they, we was with a man and his wife who were school teachers, and uh, they didn't know what to do. And you dived under the table. Mm -hmm. My mum said, "If we're going to get killed, we're going to get killed in London," and we came back. Well, I didn't see it any of war time because I was evacuated in. Buckinghamshire to a little village, Asheridge, and I think there we must have gone in the early 40s, 1940, and we came home, I think it was 1953. Well, my two sisters had gone late 39s. Then Molly and I, my younger sister, were going to be evacuated to Cornwall, and where they went, Cathy and Margie had been evacuated, um, which was 
a beautiful house and the people that owned that house came to me came to visit my mum and dad and said that they had a tenant farmer and would they think that they would be well looked after by the tenant farmer and his housekeeper and um, how would my mum and dad like us two girls to go to live there where the four girls would be together and it was a decision that was absolutely wonderful and it made a different way of life for us four girls. Okay. It was Sir John Forsdyke and he then was the um, director of the British Museum. We just lived an idyllic, happy childhood. I remember one particular time coming out of the co cottage and Floyd saying to Molly and I, um, you see the sky, it's red. He said, that's where your parents are. And this is bombing and you can see the red sky. I suppose he was trying to tell us, you know, the situation. He loved the two of us, but he didn't know at the end of that day what would be happening to us, because that must have been in the middle of the blitz. Yeah, he was in the ship, we were in the shelter, but I can't remember much about the shelter. I was just sitting there like, if you know what I mean. And we had to come out because the firemen said that it would be flooding because of the water they were putting on the top of the buildings, like, round the back of Morgan. And I, I remember something coming out, and the first thing I see was was these, all the windows are light, like, all round the frames of wood, 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 they was all burning, which quite, was quite a spectacle for a young kid, like, you know, seven years old. Of course, it was being gutted. I mean, bombed right the way down to um, uh, St Paul's, more or less, you know. The citizens of Finsbury headed for the shelters during air raids. Some of them makeshift. They have vanished now, but Jean and Cecil search for some signs of the entrance to their local shelter in King's Square. It would have been, the entrance would have been more or less in front of us. Yes. Powell Street, yeah. went into King Square, and then you had President Street there. Mm. There was the entrance to the park, wasn't it? Yeah. You just, all you had was the um, steps, you went down the steps, and obviously all the bays were all under the park. And uh, my sister, Eileen and Louis Lewis, her friend, they used to run the canteen down there. Uh, they used to do teas and coffees and bread and stuff. We had um, Bly, who was Colin's relation, she used to play the accordion. And we had a, an A to Russia concert where people uh, played or got up and sang and things like that. And they was collecting money for it. So it was quite a community, even though it was down the shelter, because it was well laid out. There was all bunk beds, and uh, the children, you know, was put to bed. Yes. But you got fleas. <laughs> My mum used to have to delouse me every day. <laughs> because, and you know, because there's so many of you in the shelter. I mean, I can come in, remember coming out of my building and looking down Frowning Road and seeing St Paul's just lit up with a, a red sky where the fire, where the city was alight. And I'll never forget that, that scene of St Paul's against a red background. And that was because the city was alight. We, we sheltered for in the... Uh, Wenlock Brewery in the beer cellars, after, it, after the brewery shut down in the evening, we were allowed in with our bedding, and that's where we bedded down for the night. And then this rogue bomb dropped, and it dropped on the ammonia plant, which see, and all the fumes seeped through the cellars where we, we were sleeping in the beer cellars. So there was a lot of panic. 
and uh, there was two entrances, I believe, and I ran to one with my little cousin, who was two years old, because my aunt had a young baby in arms. It was everyone for themselves. I mean, we all got out separately. The whole family got out separately, but we didn't know who had survived until later on in the day. And uh, it was just pure luck that we got out because I chose one exit that it was a steep flight of stairs, but it was covered with bodies because people had fallen, stumbled as they were getting out, trying to get out. And it, it, it was just an awful ordeal, you know, just like you, you, you were fighting for your life. Final toll was never established, nor was it publicised. It was kept quite secret. It wasn't, there, there was no news about it at all. It was never in the papers. And I mean, people were dying even years after from the effects of the ammonia fumes. He was a fireman and he worked at the Clerkenwell Fire Station. He was in the thick of it. They, they used to do the city. 1940, and there's my father. And at the back is taxis with the hoses on top. That's how they first started. They had no fire engines, they didn't have any anything at all. My mum, of course, was, you know, always worried about him. Yeah. As children, we, we didn't think of it, did you, as children? I just wondered, you know, I used to say to my mum, why are they bombing us, you know, what, is, what have we done? I could never understand. Well, my father came in a taxi during the Blitz and uh, when they were bombing the city and uh, he got us out and he took us to Parliament Hill Fields to get us away from the bombing and everything was alight. The, the whole of the city was alight at the time and uh, he took us to Parliament Hill Fields and we could see the flames at Parliament Hill Fields or or city alike. It was, it was horrendous. You live from day to day. You didn't know. You didn't know whether you're going to get bombed at, on on that night and be there the next day. Nobody knew from day to day. Happy birthday to you. Hold the candles. Happy birthday, Jim Harris. Happy birthday. Hey, to you. I was born 1920. And you married in 1940? Yeah. And then I was evacuated with the war. He was a baby in arms then. You came back because your mother was killed in... Uh, My mum was killed in Peary Street where I was born. And uh, the, eye, the eye hospital, it backed onto the flat she was in. And it all, that's why I couldn't get no photos when I was little because everything went. The place went everything and uh, she got killed but my brother, my oldest brother, he wouldn't let us go and see her. He said no, remember, remember mum as she was. I was in raids all the time but the, the, the doodle bugs, we used to, uh, being on the top floor, you could see them coming over. And when they stopped, you just prayed that it wasn't your turn because they used to silently come down. As soon as it stopped, you knew that it would silently come down and hit wherever it was going. Um, the street before us got hit, it was coming down and we thought it was going to come and hit our estate, but it hit the all the houses in the street before us 
So and it blew up and all, all the bodies and it was terrible, yeah. The whole street demolished. Mm. As a child, I mean, it was a terrifying. You know, when you think of a terrible, terrible thing, really, isn't it? Terrible thing. And you made the most of your life. You made the, yeah. you made the most of your life every, every day. You got up from that and you just got carried on with your day. Yeah. He went to North Africa and he was reported missing October 1942 at the Battle of Al Alamein. And I think he was killed in a minefield. My parents were absolutely devastated, particularly my mum. And she never really wanted to talk about it. So, but so many people, you know, locally here, the small community, they lost quite a lot of people, young men in the Second World War. So you all, up to a point, I suppose, grieved together. And before the war, on his, on, next door to his stall, there was a, a pickle stall, and it was, Jew, it, it was Jewish. But he used to have all these barrels with the pickled herrings in and the sour herring and everything. And then he married a Dutch woman, and they had two children. And she got homesick, so she wanted to go back to Holland. So they went back, and they, this was at the outbreak of war. They went back, he went with her. Well, they all finished up in a concentration camp. Oh and we God. knew this, we, we knew like through the grapevine because his family still lived here. The only one that survived was him. He was Lou, his name was Lou. He was the only one that survived. And he came back and he tried hard to start again, like with his pickle stall in the in the market. He finished up committing suicide. Oh. He couldn't yeah, he couldn't just... live he couldn't live with the thoughts that his wife and children had died and he'd survived. Mm -hmm. When did you leave school? Fifteen. Yeah, I was fifteen. Remember, it was labour intensive in those days. Yes, it was. A, it was all manual. All, wo all work was manual. Yes. Yeah. Well, somebody so, had to build the country up after the war, and we were that basically the first generation, really. Yeah. And it was all factory, like you say, manual yeah. factories. Yeah. Yes. All these little firms all sprung up after the yes. war, you know. Well, I was 14 then, and Dad said, we'd better get you a job. And I was walk I walking down Beverden Street, which is Shoreditch, and there was this little factory, and it was called Testy and Sons, Italian immigrants, like they were very nice people. Just a boy wanted up there, boy wanted. But Dad said, we might as well try an air boy. So I went in there, and uh, I don't know why, I just stayed there. And I, I, I worked for that company till I was, what, about 74, 75. I non-stop, didn't, didn't work for anybody else. That was, that was it. And soon as it was after the war, there was a lot of industry to catch up with, like, you know? You had so many opportunities because there was people was getting back on their feet, like, you know what I mean? And they used to come to our little company because it was easy and, and they'd bring what they wanted. And in the end I, I got fed up with work at 73 and I said to him, uh, well I'm going to pack up. He said, so am I. So the company packed up. Just like that. After about 150 years in the trade. I walked out the door and that was it. 1950, that was. I'm in the typing pool, and typing out the invoices. Oh, the company is, is Lillian Skinner's. Uh, I started 
as a junior in, in Linnean Skinners and then I, I got onto the got into the typing pool. They all the orders used to come up through the pipe. And I left school on the Friday and I started work on the Monday. I just didn't have any <laughs> I was very good. I mean we had to work work hard. It was a good firm to work for. We had so many companies in this area. Yeah. I know true. you can never be out of work. As well as City of London services like banking and insurance, Finsbury was packed with local established industries of all kinds. Jewellers, watchmakers, brewers, manufacturing, printing. The rates ploughed in and Finsbury became a wealthy borough essential to fund the visionary building programmes. I mean, you could walk out of one job and go and do another. Where did you uh, I was a tailor. A tailor. Was you a tailor? Mm. Who did you work for? A little workshop in Exmouth Market. Oh. Yes, I went right through the trade. <laughs> I was a tailor. And I, I never liked to be called a tailoress. I was a tailor. Yeah, mm. not a dressmaker. Yeah. Not a machinist, I was yeah, a tailor. I, I, I was under an accountant who taught me the fundamentals of accountancy, which put me in very good stead. I ended up having a wonderful job in the city of London, and I, I eventually got the freedom of the city. Uh, which was a very great honour from the company. My job was with the Carpenters' Company. And so from an ordinary girl that went to work, I ended up having a very, very interesting job, mm -hmm. which I was very lucky. Because when I was young, you could get a job in the morning, and if you didn't like it, you'd go and find something else on the dinner time and start there in the, in the dark afternoon but when I was 51 it was quite different. I found a job at Parks Hospital after three months being out of work. I've only been out of work three months and I worked right up till I was 68 at Parks. I had a mini stroke because I worked too hard. But there you go. I saved a couple of people's lives. They come in with suspected heart attack and I, I recognised it straight away and when the man pulled me up in the street afterwards down the market with him he was with his wife he pulled me up he said you saved my life and I went that's what I do I got yeah two extra three people got my job they had to get me three people Once called the most innovative public housing of its time, Spa Green Estate is a testament to the vision of Finsbury Council and their relationship with Berthold Lubeckin. Spa Green was part of the Finsbury pre-war master plan, but it wasn't completed until 1949 because of the war. It must have seemed like a beacon of hope in the grey post-war landscape of austerity. Oh well, they come from far and wide to look at them because there was something new after the war. It was, it was directly after the end of the war. And of course everybody thought the whole of London was going to be like this, but this was really a one-off. But most, uh, most of these blocks, of these high-rise blocks around here, they all had modern <laughs> amenities that, you know, that we weren't used to. Everyone, everybody wanted to move into them. And no, that, it was a very good idea what he had. I do like it when I come in and think, oh, I'm in. My brother couldn't wait to get in because of the bathroom. I mean, you never had those in the houses. And oh, he couldn't wait to get in the bathroom. I tell you what, I think it's a very healthy place. It's a healthy flat. Mm. Because my dad, he died, oh, 
68. But he had chronic bronchitis, in the end it got worse. And he used to say, why don't you go around the garden or take a walk? No, no, he preferred to sit in here. Mm. And my mum, she was um, sort of semi-bedridden type of thing, so for six years she never went out of here. Yeah, a good community. So um, a lot of the ideas that Lebetkin was um, exploring in his earlier projects were sort of rolled out here for, for council tenants and a lot of the things that he'd learnt doing kind of luxury high-end apartments in Highgate were sort of recreated here on a more simple scale. And the mantra or the, the, the motto of the estate was nothing is too good for ordinary people and I think that really rings true. It was my sister's friend, her brother moved in there when it first opened and that was 1949 and we were, we were still living in old houses so to go in there it was like to go into a palace because they had the bathroom and a lovely kitchen with the waste uh, sink disposal and um, it was just like another world really and because to go up in the lift which we'd never experienced and it was such a well it was one chalk and cheese really but it was really lovely to just go into the first flats that looked like that we hadn't seen anything like it i think it's really smart it's yeah, really lovely. nice isn't lovely. it yeah. looks very expensive Might put in for an exchange. <laughs> rather nice. It would be nice, yeah. The uh, Finsbury Borough Council, uh, way back in the 30s and 40s, were a very go ahead council, uh, but they also invested in very good social housing. There is the most wonderful uh, uh, building, Bevin Court, um, which uh, uh, was designed so beautifully. It has a central space that has a double helix staircase in it and mosaics round the ground floor. And uh, even though it was built all those years ago, it's still a, a highly desirable place to live. And uh, that uh, old Finsbury Borough Council knew a thing or two about creating good things for the public, whether it was in health or housing or the general work of the council. I spent the best years of my youth at Finsbury Town Hall, dancing every Saturday night. Yeah, the best years of my life. I mean, I always say I come from Finsbury. I don't even think of a Sinton. It's beautiful. Oh, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, where do they build like this now? <laughs> I thought it was wonderful. It was like nothing else I'd walked into. And so to come here for that little time was wonderful, you know? It was a different world. Well, I think it's even better than I remember it, to be honest. I mean, when you used to come dancing, you probably didn't notice the scenery too much. And I think when you come and look at it now, it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it was, it was a lovely place to come to dance. It, was, it only cost about a shilling to get in. And the boys used to stay on one side of the hall, and we used to be the other. And then they used to walk across to ask you to dance. And if you didn't fancy them, <laughs> You say, oh, I hope he's not going to ask me. <laughs>
There I had to dance with the Lady Mayoress. My dad couldn't dance. Couldn't put two feet together. Oh, yeah. But perhaps Joe made up for it in other ways. As chair of the housing committee, Joe and the council worked to improve housing and reduce housing shortages. They carried on a tradition of bold, innovative housing and public services. I think that was the worst day's work when we amalgamated with Islington. I like Finsbury as Finsbury. Yeah, I grew up in Finsbury, I like Finsbury. Went through the war in Finsbury and we come out the other side. Yeah, they were lucky in one sense. The people didn't have the money, the people didn't pay the money, but three or four streets are in the city of London and they, they provided 90% of rate income, over 90% of rate income. So it allowed the councillors to do things but without punishing the people with high rates. When this film of Chapel Street, Finsbury's most popular market, was shot in 1965, the people of Finsbury were about to lose their council. Local government reorganisation of the 1960s signalled the end of the borough of Finsbury. Rates from businesses close to the city made the council all the more attractive for a takeover, and this is what happened in 1965. In April 1965, Finsbury Council gathered for a final historic meeting after 60 distinguished years of serving the people. There it goes, and that's how it changes. You can put it all back. You can put you can put the 1890s back as what it was, history, local. I was born here, I lived here, I lived here all my life. You can put these back and find out and keep a sense of history. If you want a picture which shows you um, the changing world of London as we stand here with the football pitches, you've got a good building site over there. The land is, it, it, is worth so much money now, isn't it? So they're taking down uh, buildings or they're building on top of buildings. Um, there's one around here called Finsbury Tower that was um, a 12-storey building and now they're putting another 12 storeys on top of it. And that's what's been going on for the last eight, ten years around here. It's been construction all the time. I mean, the, the stress of it gets you down. To me, money laundering. <laughs> That's all I can think of. I can't think where the money... No, no, it's not social housing, not a, none of it. It's not for people who live in the borough because they wouldn't be able to afford the rents anyway. And it, they're just putting all these places up and pricing everybody out, really. And they make it look an absolute eyesore. Yeah. I mean, you look at City Road and round there, it's awful. It's just tall blocks. And they're so ugly that it's taking all the character away from the area. Them next to us, 
the one and two bedroom starting at 650,000. Over the other side of the road, there's two other blocks there. And, and when Moorfields Isles will go, that'll be an hotel, that will be. Oh, the amount of motels that are down City Road is unbelievable. Even the, even the old um, workhouse in Shoreditch, in Shepherdish Walk, has been converted. I don't know if it's offices or flats. The old workhouse. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> the soup kitchen is aware is an hotel. <laughs> Joe is a trustee of the St Luke's Community Centre, a charity rooted in Finsbury. If you were to look for Finsbury's heart and soul, you might find it here. St Luke's provides much needed facilities for our community, preserving some of the old Finsbury traditions of caring and sharing. I know, I know this centre has been a lifeline for Mum, it's kept her alive because I have to book up to go and visit her now because she's never home, she's always here. Three times a week she spends here and uh, I've learned how to play boy. The St Luke's art class proved to be a life changer for one of our own group. Look, I went there because I'd lost my grandson. I told you he was 11 years of age. And um, he died one morning. And uh, I took it rather badly. The doctors said, like, you know, do something. I went there to do, and I started to do art. And I painted. She taught me how to paint. But I, I took it up and um, I paint, and these are the, some of the paintings that I do. Yeah, I've got a tremor, and you lose yourself in painting. I, ne I don't shake when, when I paint. Good therapy. And they, well, used to call me young Trotsky. He used to say, oh, you go following your father's footsteps and things like that. Once upon a time, I, I used to say I wasn't, didn't want to get involved with politics because I never hardly used to see him, only except for a weekend. And he was on, he was on so many committees. I got a job at. Um post office headquarters. On the occasion of a forthcoming list of birthday honours to submit your name to the Queen. Oh, I nearly fainted. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I wish my mum was here. The original chains and everything, what, what happened to them? Someone got into the mayor's office and it was always in a, he had a glass cabinet in there on show. And it got stolen and they got stolen. On uh, Lever Street where I was born at 74 Lever Street, the block of flats that I live in now, Barnabas House. I live directly over where I would have been born, which is fantastic for me. And I can see my family all the time. They've all gone, all my sisters and brothers no longer, and my husband. But the memories are fantastic. Thanks for the coffee, Polly, by the way. Very nice.